Live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering AWS reinforce 2019. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services and its ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone. It's theCUBE's live coverage here in Boston, Massachusetts for AWS Reinforce. This is Amazon Web Services' inaugural conference around cloud security, their first of what looks like will be more focused events around deep dive security. It's kind of like a reinvent for security, but not, no one's actually saying that, but it's not a summit, it's a branded event. Reinforce. We're here with Mark Ryland, off, Director Office of the CISO at AWS. Yeah. Thanks for coming back. Good great to, to see you, CUBE alumni. Yeah, I've been here <laughs> before, it's fun. We had a great chat at AWS Summit in New York City uh, last year. You know, we're talking about some of these same issues, but now you have a dedicated conference here, um, yeah. and the feedback from the CISOs we've talked to and, and the partners in the ecosystem is, it's great to have an event where they can go deep dives yeah. on some of the key things that are really, really important to security. Absolutely. And this is really kind of the vibe that how reInvent started, right? So reInvent yeah. was a similar thing for commercial. You go deep dive, EC2, S3. Here yeah. it's deeper on Amazon, but with security. Yeah, security lens on some of the, all those same issues. One, one thing that happened and kind of signaled to us that we needed an event like this over the years with reInvent was consistently over the years, the security and compliance track became one of the most important tracks that was oversubscribed and overflow rooms and like, hey, there's a signal here, right? <laughs> um, and so, um, but at the same time, we wanted to be able to reach an audience maybe that wouldn't go to reInvent because they thought, hey, as all the crazy DevOps guys are doing this cloud yeah. thing, but um, now, of course, they're getting the strong message in their security organizations like, hey, we're doing cloud and maybe as a security professional, I need to really get smart about this stuff. And, and so it's been a nice transition from still a lot of the same people, but a definitely the you know, different crowd that's coming here. And well, it's a cross-pollination between multiple, and I was just at public sector summit, they talk about cybersecurity yeah. from a national defense and intelligence standpoint. Obviously, Theresa yeah. Carlson leads that team. You got on the commercial side. Yeah. Companies like Splunk who are you know, data and they get into cyber. So you're starting to see kind of the mm -hmm. intersection of all the kind of Amazon ecosystems kind of coming around security, yeah. where it's now part of, it's a horizontal, it's not yeah. just these are the security vendors and partners, right. it's pretty much everyone's kind of becoming native into thinking about security, yeah. and there's benefits that you guys have with that. Yeah. So talk about that, I mean, Amazon has to have a framework, <laughs> a posture. Yeah. They call it shared responsibility, but I get that, you're sharing Amazon with the ecosystem, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Talk about the, the Amazon um, Web Services posture for this new security world. Well, the new security world is, if you look at like a, a typical you know, security framework, like NIST 800-53, you know, 250 controls, all these different things that you need to worry about if you're a security professional. And so what AWS is able to do is say, look, there's a whole bunch of these that we can take care of on your behalf, there's some that we'll do some things and you got to do some things, and there's some that are still your responsibility, but we'll try to make it easy for you to do those parts. So right off the bat, we, can, we get a lot of wins from just, hey, there's a lot of things we'll just take care of and you can essentially delegate to us. And for the, what remain, you'll take your expertise and you'll refocus it on more like application security. There's still maybe some operating systems or whatever, if you're using virtual machine service, you still have to think about that, but even there, We'll use, we have systems manager, we'll make it easy to do patch management, updating, et cetera. And if you're willing to go all the way to like a Lambda or some kind of a platform capability, we make it super easy because all you got to do is make sure your code is good and we'll take care of all the infrastructure automatically on your behalf. So um, yeah. that share responsibility remains. There's a lot of things you still need to be careful about and do well, but your experts can refocus, they can be very, yeah. you know, like there's just a lot less to worry about. It's, so it's a really, nice message for how to, raise the bar for the whole community, but yet still have that And that it focus. stays online with the AWS value proposition, which is, you know, build <laughs> stuff, ship fast, lower prices, Amazon ethos in general. Yeah. But when you think about the core AWS, what made it so great was, you can reduce the provisioning of resources to get yeah. something up and running. Yep. And I think that's what I'm taking away from the security piece. You guys are saying, hey, we know Amazon Web Services really well, yeah. and we're going to do these things, you can do that, so us and them, and then parts to innovate. Um, so I get that, that's yeah. good. The other trend I want to get your reaction to is comments we've had on theCUBE with CISOs and customers is a trend towards building in-house, coding mm. security. Yeah. To your point about Lambda, some cool things are being enabled through AWS. Yep. There's a real trend of big, large companies with security teams to saying, hey, you know what, I want to optimize my talent right. to code and be security focused on use cases that they care about. Yep. So, you know, Andy Jassy talks about builders, you guys talk about builders. You got, companies, your customers building. 
Absolutely. Yet they don't want to be security, security vendors per builders. se, but they are becoming security. Yeah. So you have a builder mindset going on in the big enterprises. Yes. Talk about that dynamic. That's a, that's a really important trend, and, and we see that even in security organizations, which historically were full of experts, but not full of engineers and people that could write code. And what we're seeing now is people say, look, I have all this expertise, but I also see that with a software-defined infrastructure and everything's an API, if I pair up an engineering team with a security professional team, then what the hell, good things will happen because the security professionals will say, gosh, I do this repetitive task all the time, can you write code to do that? I'm like, yeah, we can write code to do that. So now I can focus on things that require judgment instead of just more rep repetitive. So, so there's a really nice synergy there and our security customers are becoming builders as well and they're codifying, if you don't mind the expression, in code a policy that used to just be in a document and now they write code that says, well, if that policy is whatever password length or yeah. how often we rotate credentials, whatever the policy is, we'll write code to ensure that that's actually happening. So it's a real nice confluence of you yeah. know, security expertise with the engineering discipline. And they're not building the full stack themselves. This becomes, no. again, a key agility piece. I had one customer on, uh, it was an SMS business. They imported to AWS Cloud with three engineers. Yeah. And they wrote all the Kubernetes code themselves. They could yeah. have used you know, other things, but they wanted to make sure it was stable then, so they can bring in some suppliers that can add value. So again, yeah. this is new. It used to be this way back in the old days. Yeah. You know, In-house developers build the apps on the mainframe, <laughs> build the apps on the mini computers, and then yeah, that yeah. kind of went to outsourcing. So we're kind of back to this. Kind of insourcing is the big trend now, right? Yeah. I can, with a smaller engineering team, I can do a lot that used to require you know, so many more people with a big waterfall method and long-term projects. And now I take all these powerful building blocks and put an engineering team, five people, or what we would call a two pizza team, five or six people, yeah. off to the side, give them three, four weeks, and they can generate a really cool <laughs> system that would have required months and not years before. So yeah. that's a big trend and, and it applies across the board, including to security jo uh, jobs. I think there's a so. sea change and I think it's clear. What I like about this show is it's cloud security, but it's also, they have the on-premises conversation because mm -hmm. there's legacy applications sure. that have been secured and or need to be secured as they evolve, and then you got cloud native and all these things together where security has to be built in. Yeah. This is a key theme. So I want to get your thoughts on this notion of built-in security from day one. Yeah. What's your, what's your view on this and how should customers start thinking about it and what are you guys bringing to the table? Well, I think that's just a general, let's say, maturation that goes on in the industry, whether it's cloud or on-prem, is that people realize that the old methods we used to use, like, hey, I'm going to build an app and then I'm going to hand it to the security team and they're going to put firewalls around it. That's not really going to have a good result. So security by design, having security as equal co aspect of, hey, if I'm getting, doing an architecture, I look at performance, I look at cost, I look at security. It's just part of my system design. I don't think of it as like a bolt-on afterwards. So that leads to things like, you know, secure DevOps and kind of integration of teams. These are, this can be happening on premises too. It's just part of IT modernization, I think. Yeah. But cloud is clearly a driver as well. And cloud makes it easier because it's all programmable. So things that are still manual on premises you can do in a more automated fashion. They're getting so. into a lot of conversations here under the covers, a lot of under the hood conversations here at this, around security. EC2, one of the most popular services mm -hmm. you guys have, obviously, uh, compute. Yeah. Big part of, you mentioned Lambda, another, another feature. VPC, traffic flows for mirroring was a big yeah. announcement. A lot of people talking about that. A lot of people talking about the EC2 Nitro. You gave a talk on that. I did, did yeah. You just unpack that a little bit because sure. this has been nuanced out there, it's out there, yeah. but people are interested in it. What's that talk about? Inscription is, is a popular conversation. Take a minute to explain your talk. Sure, so we've talked for now a year and a half about how we've essentially reimagined, reinvented our virtual machine architecture to um, go from a, a primarily software-defined system where you have an, uh, a main board with memory and Intel processor and all the kind of accoutrements of a standard server and then your virtualization layer would run a full copy of an operating system, which we would call a DOM0 or privileged OS that would mediate access between the guest OS's and, this, and the outside world because it would maintain the device model. Like how do I talk to a network card? How do I talk to a storage device? I talk through the hypervisor, but through also a DOM0, a, a copy of Linux, a copy of Windows, to do all that I.O. So what we've just did over the past few years, we began to take all the things that were running inside that privileged OS and move that into dedicated hardware, software hardware combination, where we now have components, we call Nitro components. They're actual separate little computers that do EBS processing, they do VPC processing, they do instance storage. So 
at this point now, we've taken all of the components of that DOM0, we've moved it out into these, you could call coprocessors. I almost think of them as like the Nitro controller is the main processor and the Intel motherboard is a coprocessor where customer workloads run because the trust now is in these external systems and when you go to talk to the outside world from an EC2 now, you're talking through these very trusted, very powerful coprocessors that do encryption, they do identity management for you, they do a lot of work that's off the main processor, but we can accelerate it, we can be more assured that it's trustworthy, it can, it can protect itself from potential types of hacks that might have been exposed if that, say, an encryption key was in the, in the main motherboard, now it's not. So, uh, it's a long story, I did a one hour version and I'm doing it in three minutes now, but overall we feel that we built a much more trustworthy what system for virtual machine services. What was services. the title of the talk so people can find it online? So it's just called the, the Nitro Architecture, Security Implications of the Nitro Architecture. So it's taking information that we had out there, but we're like highlighting the fact that if you're a security professional, you're going to really like the fact that this system has, it has no DOM0, it has no shell, you can't log into these systems as a human being, it's impossible to log in. Mm -hmm. it's all software defined, software driven, and all the encryption features are in these coprocessors, so um, we can do like full line rate encryption of 100 gigabits of, you know, of network traffic, and it's all encrypted. Like that's never been done before really in the history of computing. So. What's the benefit of the Nitro architecture? Real, real <coughs> simply Yeah, so in a nutshell, it? you know, more trust built into a, a trusted root that's not the main board, um, encryption offload, um, and more isolation, because even if I somehow were to manage to do the impossible combination of facts to get sort of like ownership of that main board, I still don't have access to the outside world from there. I have to go through a whole other layer of very secure software that mediates between the inner world of where customer workloads run and the outside world where the um, actual cloud is. So it's just a bunch of layers that make things more secure. Yeah. And I'm sure Outpost will have that as well. Can't yeah, wait to, can't based wait to, on that same can't, design. Can't wait to hear about that. Yeah. Okay, uh, encryption, uh, encrypt everything is a philosophy we heard in the keynote. Yep. You also talk about that as well. Um, in, encrypting traffic on the outside, inside. Talk about what that means, what was talked to you, what's the big conversation around encryption within AWS, just inside AWS, outside AWS, what's yeah. the main uh, the story there? So there's a lot of pieces to the pie, but a big one that we were talking about this week is a, is a, is a pretty long-term project we call Project Lever. It was actually named after a, a, a female cryptographer in Betchley Park team that was helped, you know, one of the major factors in winning World War II were these uh, mathematicians and cryptographers. So we, we wanted to do a big scale encryption project. Um, and we had a very large scale network and we had uh, you know, all the features you normally have, but we wanted to make it so that we really encrypted everything when it was outside of our physical control. So we done that, took a long time, huge investment, really exciting now going forward, everything we build. So anytime data that customers give to us or have traffic between regions, between instances within the same region, outside regions, whenever that traffic leaves our physical control, so kind of our building boundaries or gates and guards, and it's going down a street on a fiber optic to another data center maybe not far away, or going intercontinent, mm -hmm. intercontinental links or going suboceanic links, all those links now, we encrypt all the traffic all the time. And what's so, the benefit of that? Just so the benefit hacking. of that is there's still, you know, it's, it's obscure, but there is a threat model where, you know, governments have special submarines that are known to exist that go and sniff those uh, transoceanic links and, you know, potentially a bad guy could somehow get into one of those network yeah. um, junction points or whatever, inspect traffic. It's not a, I would say, a high risk, but it's, it's possible. Um, and so that's now a whole, that's a whole other level of phishing attacks, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> phishing attacks. You get a submarine, yeah, you're highly motivated one. to sniff that line. <laughs> the, good one. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's now. So we, people can feel comfortable yeah. that, that that protection exists. And even things like here's a kind of a little bit of obscure example, but we had customers that say, look. Uh, I, I'm a European customer and I have a very strong sense of regional regionality. I want to be inside the European community with all my data, et cetera. And you know, what about Brexit? So now I've got all this traffic going through a very large internet peering point in London and London won't be part of Europe anymore according to kind of legal norms. So what are you doing in that case? And like, well, how about this? How about if, yes, the, the packets are moving through London, but they're always encrypted all the time. Does that make you feel good? Yeah, that makes me feel good. I mean, I, so my, my notion of where it as extra-territorial, extra-regional yeah. can be modified to accept the fact that, hey, if it's just ciphertext, it's not quite the same as un, yeah. unencrypted data. I think data, people so. generally like the idea of encrypted traffic. <clears throat> I mean, it just yeah. makes a lot of sense. Why it absolutely you, does. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah. All right, now, uh, final question. Um, at this event, 
A lot of attendee, high, high, high caliber people yeah. on the spectrum. Biz, from biz dev, people building out the ecosystem, to hardcore techies looking under the hood, to CISOs who mm -hmm. oversee the regimes within companies, yeah. either with the CIO or whatever, how that ever is formed. And every company's different, but there's a lot of CISOs here. Yeah. Chief Information Security Officers. You bet. You are in the office of the Chief Security <laughs> Information Officer. So, yeah. um, what is the conversations they're having? Because we're hearing a lot of DevOps-like conversations sure. in a security, back, with a security backdrop about, you know, not just chess and dev, but hackathons, getting new stuff built and then moving into the production, yep. little operations, little dev, sec, ops, so these kinds of things are all kind of coming together. Yep. What are you hearing from those customers um, inside Amazon? Because I know you guys are customer driven. Sure. Listen to customers. And the CISOs, as your customer, what are they saying? What are they asking for? So CISOs are, first of all, getting their own minds around this big tr technical transformations that are happening, um, and they're thinking about risk management and compliance and things that they're responsible for. They've got to report to a board or a board committee that say, hey, we're doing things according to the norms of our industry or the regulated you know, industries that we sit in. So they're building the knowledge base and the expertise and the teams that can translate from this sort of modern devops -y thing uh, to these more traditional frameworks, like hey, I've got this oversight by the Securities and Exchange Commission or by the banking regulators or what have you, and, and we have to be able to explain to them why our security posture not only is maintained, but in some ways improved in, these, in this new world. So their, their challenge now is both developing their own understanding, which I think they're doing a good job at, but also kind of building this, the muscle, the strength, the terminology to translate between these new technologies, new worlds, and uh, more traditional frameworks that they, they sit within and, and people who give, have oversight over them. So they've got a risk, so there's risk committees on yeah. boards of these large public you know, organizations. And the risk committees don't know a lot about cloud computing. So, um, so they're, part of what they do now is they do that translation function and they can say, look, I've, I've got assurances based on my work that I do and the technology and my compliance frameworks that I can meet the risk profiles that we traditionally yeah. met in other ways with this new technology. So it's, it's a pretty interesting translation. And you, know, you guys had good success with the CIA, certainly in public sector, those yeah. big security oriented companies. Yeah. Uh, as well as the other trend of they got to educate the boards and that they're secure and yeah. not get hacked, obviously. Yeah. And then there's the um, innovation side of it. Yeah. Where they actually got to build out. Yes. This is what we just talked well, about Well, and again, a big change for our CISOs that we talk to and work with all the time is, the, the, hey, we're an engineering community now. We didn't used to write a lot of code, and now we do. Um, we're, we're getting strong in that way, or else we're partnering very closely with an engineering team who has yeah. dedicated teams that support our security requirements and yeah. build the tools we need to know that things are going well from our perspective. So that's a really cool, I think, change I think in that's the environment. I think that is probably one of the, my favorite trends that I see because it really shows the criticality of Security, which pretty much all critical, you don't need to hack. Yeah. But having that code coding focus yeah. really shows that they're building in-house use cases that they care about, and the, the, the fact that I can now get native network traffic, yeah. and you guys are exposing new sets of services with land and other things over the top, yep. it just makes for a good environment for, to do these cloud security things. Yeah. That seems to be the show in a nutshell. Yeah, and I think that's one of the nice things about the show is it's a very positive energy here. It's not like the fear and scary stuff that you sometimes hear at security conferences, like, hey, the sky's falling, buy my yeah. product kind yeah. of thing. Here it's much more of a collaborative, like, hey, we got some serious challenges, there's some yeah. bad guys out there, they're going to come after us. Yeah. But as a community, using new tooling, new techniques, yeah. modern approaches, modernization generally, yeah. like, let's get rid of a lot of these crufty old systems we've never <laughs> updated for 10 or 20 years. Um, it's, it's a positive energy, which yeah. is really exciting. It's good well, to Mark, be part of that. Mark, great to get your insights. Obviously, this is your wheelhouse show. Congratulations. Thank you, it's great. I got to ask you here. the question, just you know, take your uh, CISO Amazon hat off, just as an industry participant riding this way, being involved in it. Yeah. What is the most important story that needs to be told in the press, in the media, that should be told, what's that, that is important? Either it's being told it, and should be amplified, or not being told and be written out. What's the, what's the top story that, well, that, that you think? Well, I still think that even after all this time, that you know, when people hear public cloud computing, they still have this kind of instinctive reaction, like, oh, that sounds kind of scary or a little bit risky, and you know, we, we need to get to the point where those words don't elicit some sense of risk in people's minds, but rather elicit like, oh, cool, that's going to help me be secure instead of being a challenge 
Um, now there's a journey and people have to get there, and our customers who go deep, Gary consistently say, and I'm sure you've had them say to you, hey, I feel more confident in my cloud-based security than I do in my on-premises security. But that's still not like kind of the initial reaction, and so we're, we still have a ways so to go. So moving from a fear-based mentality to much more of a... <clears throat> yeah, modernization-based. Like modernization. this is the modern way to get the results and the outcomes I want. Yep. And cloud is a part of that, and I, it doesn't not only doesn't scare me, I want to go there because well, it's going to take um, a community as well. Yeah, to absolutely. Do that. Sure. Mark, thanks so much for coming back on it's the great to be and sharing. Here. Great, Mark, Mark Riley, director of in the office of the chief information security officer at Amazon Web Services here, sharing his insight, extracting the signal about the top stories and the most important things being being said and discussed and executed here at Reinforce on the Cube. Thanks for watching. We'll be right back with more after this thanks. short break.